This is a homily for the 30th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. As with the past four Sundays, today's Gospel is also set on the Tuesday of what we now know as Holy Week. Let's quickly review all that has happened so far on this Tuesday. And just incidentally, is it possible to determine the precise date of this Tuesday? Well, firstly, we know that Jesus and the disciples were in Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. And Passover begins on the 15th day of Nisan, the first month of the Jewish calendar. But that is a lunar calendar, which means that the date of Passover will vary from one year to another. Passover falls on the first full moon of spring in the Northern Hemisphere. After considering all the clues that we find in the New Testament and weighing up the evidence, New Testament scholar John Mayer comes to the tentative conclusion that Jesus was executed on the cross on April the 7th, 30 AD. That means that Holy Thursday fell that year on April the 6th, and today's Gospel is therefore set on Tuesday, April the 4th, 30 AD. So, what happens on that Tuesday? Jesus had spent Monday night at Bethany, and on Tuesday morning he returns to Jerusalem. On the way to the holy city, Jesus was hungry, and seeing a fig tree by the road, he goes up to it but finds nothing on it but leaves. He says to it, May you never bear fruit again, and instantly the fig tree withers. As I've already suggested, this anticipates the condemnation of the chief priests and elders of the people in the parables that will soon follow. The Jewish leadership has not produced the fruits of righteousness and justice. Once within the temple precincts, Jesus is challenged by the chief priests and elders of the people about what he had done on the previous day. By what authority do you do these things? And who gave you this authority? Jesus responds to this question with the parable of the father and his two sons. That is followed by the parable of the wicked tenants, the gospel that we heard on the 27th Sunday in Ordinary Time. That in turn is followed by the parable of the wedding feast, the gospel for the 28th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Pharisees then begin manoeuvres to trap Jesus. They send their disciples to him together with the Herodians. As we saw last Sunday, This was an extremely odd alliance. They ask hypocritically, Is it permissible to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That was last Sunday's Gospel. It is now the turn of the Sadducees. The Sadducees dominated the temple worship and its rites, and many of them were members of the Sanhedrin, the supreme governing body of the Jews. They would have been on high alert after hearing that people had hailed Jesus as Son of David when he entered the city on the previous day. His actions in the temple would also have rung alarm bells. So their ploy is to discredit his teaching. The Sadducees accepted only the five books of Moses as authentic scripture and they therefore refused to believe in the resurrection of the dead, arguing that there was no mention of life after death in the Torah. To ridicule belief in the resurrection of the dead, they raised a hypothetical scenario about a woman who had married seven brothers, marrying one brother after another following the death of each of them. Which of the seven would she be married to at the resurrection of the dead. Jesus tells them they are wrong because they understand neither the scriptures 
nor the power of God. The lectionary passes over that episode in year A. It is, however, read in year C. We now come to today's Gospel. Jesus is asked a question by the Pharisees. Note the opposition to Jesus. From the disciples of the Pharisees and Herodians, from the Sadducees, and again from the Pharisees. So, the Pharisees attempt to put Jesus to the test. Although they disagreed with the Sadducees about the resurrection of the dead, they are at one with them in their opposition to Jesus. One of them, a lawyer, that is, a teacher of the law, puts a question to Jesus. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Before considering how Jesus responds, let's keep in mind who the Pharisees were. Most scholars today agree that the name Pharisee derives from the Hebrew and Aramaic parush or perushi, which means one who is separated. The plural is perushim. They were zealous in their observance of the Torah and presumably were called perushim because they separated themselves from anyone who did not share their zeal. The question asked is thoroughly rabbinic. Which is the greatest commandment of the law? Although in one sense all commandments were considered to be of equal weight, in practice rabbis had to distinguish between heavy and less weighty commandments. So the question is asking, which is the most central? What matters most? Which commandment should be the guide by which other commandments are to be understood? By way of example, the Talmud records a story about a rather unusual request made by a Gentile to two of the best-known rabbis of the first century, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. The Gentile asked the rabbis to teach him the whole of the Torah, but while standing on one foot. In other words, he didn't want any long-winded answers. Keep it short. Rabbi Shammai seemed to take offence at the question and drove the man away with a stick because he said, the Torah cannot be crystallised. But... Rabbi Hillel took up the challenge and replied, What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbour. That is the whole Torah. The rest is commentary. Go and learn it. Matthew makes it clear, however, that the Pharisees are not asking the question in good faith. Their intent is malicious. The Jerusalem Bible says they are trying to disconcert Jesus. The New Revised Jerusalem Bible says they are attempting to put him to the test. The Greek word that Matthew uses is expiradzon, which means trying to trap. In the Synoptic Gospels, this word always has negative connotations. This is the same verb that Matthew uses when he tells us in chapter 4 that Jesus was led by the Spirit out into the desert to be put to the test by the devil. The opponents of Jesus are obviously hoping that he will say something that they can use against him. So, coming back to the question, Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? What does law mean? refer to in this context. Jews call the Bible the Tanakh. Christians call the Tanakh the Old Testament, but the arrangement of the books in the Old Testament is slightly different. Hebrew was originally written using only consonants, in other words, without vowels. So the three consonants are T, N and K. T stands for Torah, N for Nevo'im, and K for Ketuvim. Once we insert vowels, we have the word Tanakh. 
But although the copy of the Tanakh that you can see here is one volume, like a Christian Bible, it is in fact a collection of books or scrolls. In the Torah, often translated as law, there are five scrolls. In the Nevaim, or prophets, there are eight scrolls. And in the Ketuvim, or writings, there are eleven scrolls. The Torah is also known as the Pentateuch, coming from the Greek pente, which means five, and tukos, meaning scroll or book. The five scrolls of the Torah or Pentateuch are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. The English word law doesn't fully capture the meaning of the Hebrew word Torah. Robert Alter explains, Torah means teaching, or in biblical contexts involving specific laws, something like regulation or protocol, that is, that which is to be taught as proper procedure for a given topic. Etymologically, the Hebrew word Torah is derived from the word yara, which means to teach or to shoot, as in shooting an arrow at a target. So Torah means law, instruction or direction, that which helps us hit the bullseye. Torah was originally a short instruction on a particular topic, a rule of practical conduct. So when Jesus was asked which was the greatest commandment of the law, how many commandments are we talking about? Well, the Jewish tradition has been through the five scrolls of the Torah and counted up every single commandment. They've come up with the grand total of 613 commandments. The Jewish New Testament scholar Amy Jill Levine explains, Jewish tradition recognises 613 commandments in the scriptures of Israel. One rabbinic tradition found in the Talmud, explained that there are 365 negative commandments or prohibitions. For example, you shall not kill and you shall not commit adultery that correspond to the number of days of the solar year and 248 positive commandments. For example, honour your father and mother and remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, corresponding to the number of a person's limbs. So, 365 prohibitions and 248 prescriptions. And these commandments cover virtually every aspect of ancient Israelite life, as you can see here. Let's consider dress for a moment. We find a prohibition in both Leviticus and Deuteronomy, of wearing cloth woven from wool and linen. Orthodox Jews will employ the services of someone known as a shatnez, who will inspect cloth to make sure that it doesn't violate this command. Let's consider another category that affects everybody, food. When it comes to seafood, any creature that has fins and scales may be eaten. So fish like tuna, carp, salmon and herring are all permitted. But shellfish such as lobsters, oysters, shrimp, clams and crabs are all forbidden. And rodents, reptiles, amphibians and insects are all forbidden. The prohibition against boiling a kid in its mother's milk, found twice in the book of Exodus and once in the book of Deuteronomy, was understood by the rabbis to mean an absolute separation of meat and dairy foods. This entails having to use separate cooking utensils, crockery and cutlery for meat and dairy products. As Christians, 
We may dismiss all of this as legalism taken to extremes. But the Catholic Church of my youth could also be very legalistic. The Australian historian Edmund Campion offers some interesting reflections on growing up Catholic in Australia in his book Rock Choppers. He writes, In Catholic schools, youth were introduced to the peculiar moral casuistry which made up much of popular Catholicism. One was bidden, for example, to fast from food or drink from midnight before receiving Holy Communion. Yet, what constituted food or drink? If you went to sleep with chewing gum in your mouth and then swallowed it, was the fast broken? Did toothpaste break the fast? The church law of not eating meat on Friday gave rise to other questions. Was it a sin to eat Vegemite sandwiches on Friday? Beef broth? Bonox. Sex, too, was heavy with questions for the casuists. As much as Judaism, Catholicism was a rabbinical religion of law. I can remember attending a retreat in my final year of school. The priest conducting the retreat included a question box session. We were invited to submit anonymously any questions that we might have about matters of faith or morals. After all these years, I can still recall one question that was submitted. For how long can you kiss a girl before it becomes a mortal sin? I can still remember the answer the priest gave to this question. 60 seconds. Kissing a girl for any longer than a minute would mean that you had committed a mortal sin. I can remember a classmate telling me a week or two after the retreat that he'd begun timing his kisses with his girlfriend. He'd break off at 59 seconds so he didn't commit a mortal sin. The only problem he then had, and it wasn't covered by the priest giving the retreat, how long did he have to wait until he could begin to kiss her again. So all religions can fall prey to excessive legalism. So let's come back to the question put to Jesus. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Amy Jill Levine reflects upon his response from a Jewish perspective. Jesus provides an answer that would have been familiar. He begins by citing Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This verse is part of Judaism's daily liturgy and I cannot remember a time when I did not know these words. Yet when I read this verse in the Gospels, I was surprised to find the reference to all your mind, because that is not in Deuteronomy. Jesus not only cites the verse, he adds to it. How Jewish! One takes a commandment and then extends it to be sure that it is followed appropriately. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 tells us that we are to love God with leb, heart, nefesh, soul, and meod, strength. Following the Hebrew, the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, has kadia, heart, suche, soul, and dunamis, strength. As you can see, Matthew replaces dunamis, with Dianoia, mind. In Luke's account of this episode, placed earlier in Jesus' ministry, we have heart, soul, strength, and mind. In other words, love of God entails one's whole being, the entire person, 
The demand is for total allegiance. This, says Jesus, is the greatest and the first commandment. But Jesus goes further. There is a second commandment. You must love your neighbour as yourself. Notice the careful balance. God must come first. But there is not true love of God which is not manifested through love of one's neighbour. On these two commandments hang the whole law and the prophets also. New Testament scholar John Mayer explains, In Jewish usage, commandments were said to hang on a particular passage of Scripture, in the sense that they could be shown to be derived from or implied in that passage. Therefore, the whole will of God in Scripture is derived from and is summed up in the double command of love. In short, what God wills is love. All individual commands and obligations must be measured against and judged by the canon of love. So Jesus takes one verse from the book of Deuteronomy and another verse from the book of Leviticus. On these two passages hang the whole will of God in Scripture. They can be expressed this way, giving God what belongs to God, our heart, soul, mind and strength, putting God at the centre of our lives. Amy Jill Levine offers this reflection. How much do we love God? Is our response, of course I love God, but I have a golf game on Sunday morning, so I'll need to leave services early. How much do we love one another? Of course I love my friend, but I really don't have time to visit her in the hospital because I have a chapter on Jesus and health care due to my editor. Remember what Jesus said during the Sermon on the Mount. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. In today's Gospel, Jesus tells us what that means. Love of God and love of neighbour. There is no genuine fulfilment of the law that does not flow from love of God and love for others. And this love, while certainly not divorced from emotions, is first and foremost a matter of commitment and action, of willing and doing good, not feeling good.